Hi, everybody. I'm Ben Gramico from Internachi. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. We're the world's leading organization of residential and commercial property inspectors. And this is an Internachi webinar. We do a lot of webinars, free stuff online. That's what Internachi is known for. And this is a live training class, um, a webinar class. And this is number 43. I've been doing them for a while. And it's at natchi.org slash webinars. And you can go to natchi.org slash webinars and register for the next free live interactive webinar. Interactive, you can ask questions and chat with other students online. All of our webinars are video recorded, so they're all there at that URL, natchi.org slash webinars, if you wanted to watch a, a past webinar. So Internachi, um, large organization of home inspectors, if you wanted to join and you're not a member, you've never been a member, but you want to join, um, we have some uh, coupon codes here. You can get one month free membership. You just visit natchi.org slash trial and enter the code webinar month. And if you wanted a 50% off discount from your first year membership, um, you go to natchi.org slash free and enter the code webinar. So there's an offer there. Um, we have a free tuition free college within the organization at natchi.org. Um, internachi.edu. Sorry about that. At internachi.edu, we have the only home inspector college. So if you're thinking about becoming a home inspector or taking courses, um, don't attend, don't join an unaccredited organization or go to an unaccredited school. Go to the only home inspector college, and that's at internachi.edu, and it's tuition free for all internachi members. Internachi.edu. And we are accredited by a national accrediting agency recognized by the U.S. Department of Education, and all the courses are online and free to Internet members. Internet does two things really well. One of them is we help home inspectors make more money. We help you be more successful in your home inspection business um, by um, giving you resources to increase your gross revenue. And we also do the other thing really well, which is to help you save money, um, keep money in your pocket. So we try to keep everything really low in cost. And um, just like the, the membership fee is low monthly fee. And a lot of things that Internet provides is free and online. And we also negotiate deals with our vendors. One of them is inspector website builders. So if you're a, a home inspector with a website, um, or if you're a new inspector without a website, you got to get online um, at natchiorg slash website. And we negotiated with Internet's official vendor for website designs. That's inspector website builder. And that's at natchiorg slash website. Don't be paying any more than $300 for a, a website, website design, unlimited pages, SEO, Google ranking, um, Google reviews, online scheduling, all that stuff. About 300 bucks to design a website and no more than $20 a month. So if you have a website, think about the cost that it's costing you. It should be making you money, not costing you money. In this webinar, we're gonna inspect this house. This is a, that this middle house here. I inspected it, um, found problems. We wrote a report, it took about three hours to do. And I'd like to go through that process with you and also answer your questions. So feel free to chat with folks using the chat feature, use the Q and A feature on your side and ask questions. And I'll get to your questions as well. But what we can do together is we're gonna inspect that house. We're gonna learn how it works. We're going to find problems because that house has a few defects. Uh, some of them were difficult to find. We're going to follow a standards, of, standards of practice to perform an inspection. Uh, I wrote a report using inspection software. I can show you that. We're going to read the actual report together. We can talk about how to become a home inspector, business, marketing, anything you want. So this is your time. Ask questions. Here's my schedule that I use so that um, I can manage my time during an inspection. So I leave my house early because I wanna to get to the first job early and do a system where I don't have to have anybody there. I wanna get it out of the way. And the first system I like to inspect is the roof. So I wanna arrive early, maybe quarter to eight and get on the roof using a ladder or maybe you don't do a ladder, so you're doing a, a drone. 
you got to get a pilot license, right, from the FAA. And Internachi has an online, a couple online training courses to help you prepare to take a, the drone pilot course. Now, I want to inspect the roof, get that done, write the report of that section, come down and meet my client in the driveway. That's ideal for me. That's what I really want to do. That's my goal. Get there early and inspect that house within about three hours. Sometimes I'll have two inspections that day. My next inspection will be 12. So from the first inspection to the next, it's about three, four hours. Starts at eight o'clock in the morning. First inspection should go about three hours, eight to 11, eat lunch in between. And then my second job will be 12, finish up at three, drive home, back to the office, something like that. I'm back home at five. Seven to five, it's a long, long day, but um, all of our inspectors in our home inspection company will bring home about a grand a day, gross revenue. And for this one inspection, I'm doing a home inspection and a termite, and that will be 500 bucks. About $400 for the home inspection and about 75 for the um, termite, WDO inspection. So almost, almost $500. That's pretty good. That's a, that's a great living, right? Doing a home inspection. So the important part here is time management. So in business, you want to pay attention to the time that you have. How long do you actually want to um, take to do an inspection? And how much do you charge? So the real general rule of thumb in business is you want to have a, a, like a think of a fraction. Remember back in math class, you have a top number and divided by a bottom number. The top number is gross revenue. And that's one of the things that Internet Sheet can help you with. We can help you increase that gross revenue, help you make more money, divided by your time. So you want to increase the numerator, the top number, and squeeze that denominator, that bottom number. You want to be efficient with your time. You want to manage your time. So this schedule here, of my day is an actual schedule of my day that makes me four or five hundred dollars in the morning. And you can compare that with yours. You should have something scheduled out, maybe with a pencil and paper or, or notes or something or a mental note. Because, for example, at about 10 o'clock, I have to be in the attic. If I'm not in the attic yet, then I'm behind in my process, inspection process. If I'm already in the attic, I'm feeling pretty good because I have an entire hour to wrap this inspection up and get paid. And I wrap it up in the kitchen. I like to end my inspections in the kitchen. You can start anywhere you want. You can start with the bathrooms, electrical panel, outside, whatever you want to do. This is my schedule. And I want to emphasize that this is all about just managing your time. If you're taking four, five, eight hours to do one home inspection, well, Nobody wants to be with you. Nobody wants to do an eight-hour home inspection, right? So you have to figure out two things. How do I manage my time? How much do I want to work to do an inspection? And how much am I getting paid? And that's all about math. So if you don't calculate, you won't be around very long if you don't know what to charge for your service. So InterNACHI at the InterNACHI College we have a home inspection business course and it's free and online. We highly recommend every inspector take the home inspection business course and go to chapter 11. You don't have to take the whole course. You can just jump in and go to chapter 11. And we, in chapter 11, we have two inspectors, Inspector John and Inspector Jane, and they're trying to figure out what to charge for their home inspection service and trying to make it profitable. And it has really nothing to do with their feelings, has very little to do with the market, it has everything to do with math and their intention and their, their need. So, you know, their desired income, annual salary, what is their overhead? What are their expenses? Or what, what, how much profit do they want to make? How long do they want to work per week, per month, per day? So all of that we go through in the home inspection business course. And it's a good review for you existing veteran inspectors. Make sure you're managing your time. Or if you want to grow your business, you have to do this process for inspectors that you hire. You need to systematize every process 
So if your home inspector employee is doing an inspection for you, you know when to call her up and see if she's in the attic at 10 o'clock, right? If you're checking on her, hey, how's it going in this inspection? Okay, I'll be there at 11 to help you wrap up. Okay, bye. You know, you have to systematize everything so that you can delegate down those tasks that you don't need to do. And you can run and operate a successful home inspection business as the owner. You can think about vision and money and goals and things like that and marketing while other people are doing the work, but you have to systematize the process. So this is one way to think about business. You have to, where are you in your time management? Calculate a profitable inspection fee according to your time. And this is my day here. Okay, so this is the house we're gonna inspect with all that in mind, right? With my schedule and time management in mind and also a standards of practice. I'm not just guessing about what to do during an inspection. There are certain things that are required and a lot of things not required by an inspector during an inspection. I'm required to inspect the roof. Look at this roof. How am I supposed to inspect that roof from the ground or from the parking lot, right? You can't even see it from the parking lot at that angle. You can't see this roof. You can see it a little bit from the back. I can show you that. But how are you gonna inspect this roof? If you can't inspect it, you have to tell your client that you're not going to inspect it. You have to disclaim it, exclude it, um, tell about the restriction and limitation, maybe come back or with, a, with another look at, I don't know, with a drone or um, with a contractor or a roof or something, a roof contractor. Or something. Somebody needs to get up there and take a look at the roof, or you have to put it in a report that uh, it's not part of your inspection. It's only fair that you tell your clients because according to the standards of practice, you have to inspect the roof. And the standards of practice is at natchi.org slash SOP. If we go there, let's, let's just go there now. I'll bring this over. So here's the standards of practice. And if you uh, zoom in a little bit, if you scroll down, there's a table of contents and there's roof. Roof is the first system in the standards of practice. You don't have to inspect the roof first. I do. And it tells you the inspector shall inspect from ground level or the eaves. You're not required to use a, a ladder. You're not required to walk upon any roof surface. Um, stay safe, right? And here it is here. Here's the exclusion. The inspector is not required to walk upon any roof surface. So how are you going to inspect the roof? Well, you have to or disclaim that you can't, right? That's the tough part. You have to inspect the gutters, the downspouts, the vents, flashing skylights, chimney, or other roof penetrations, and the general structure from the roof. You have to describe any the type of roof covering, and you have to report any indications of active roof leaks. This is just for the roof. How are you supposed to remember all this stuff? Well, you don't have to if you've got software. So on my phone, I've got inspection software and there's home gauge, home inspector pro. Um, I have Spectora on my um, mobile device. And that makes me look really smart because I don't have to remember everything. I can just look on my software here about what I'm supposed to inspect. The roof covering, the flashing, plumbing, gutters, downspouts. And I don't even have to remember what to say because it's all ri already written. Uh, sorry, if I can scroll. Well, I'll show you later. My inspection report template is available from all of the software providers. I have my inspection report. I still write reports, still do inspections, not for clients, but for training purposes. And you can take a look at my um, software template if you want. But the standards of practice is really important because that's the minimum standard. That's where you start to figure out your process on how to inspect any type of property because you wanna manage your time and you wanna know what to say and know what to do. And the standards, that's, that's just like a checklist of things you gotta do and say. And so you incorporate that into your software. And so that you don't have to remember everything and so you can be more efficient with your time. Remember, it's really important to be efficient with your time. You carry 
that process around with you so that you are inspecting according to a process that you hold in your hand. It helps reduce liability, makes you look smart, and you can manage your time a lot more, right? Okay, so go to the standards of practice and use that as a checklist, as a process template as well. Get your process down. So here's the roof inspection. Me, I get up on the roof. I carry very tall ladders, 40 foot aluminum, 32 foot fiberglass, 28 foot fiberglass, 12 foot aluminum for ranchers, and then the crawl space gear and the step ladder to get into the attic. But I get up on the roof. You don't have to walk, you're not required to walk upon any roof surface according to the standards of practice. So stay safe, right? But when I'm up on the roof, I'm taking a picture of everything, every roof surface, and I'm looking for problems. And that problem is probably like a crack shingle or some deterioration of the shingle surface. The roof covering is what I'm inspecting. I'm not really inspecting the system. The system is um, a bunch of parts, components make up a system. And the parts of a roof system are filled with a lot of things I can't even see, like the, the roof fastening. I can't see the, shing the shingles or the staple, the, the nails, the roof nails. I can't see the, the underlayment. I can't see the flashing. I can't see uh, the roof deck. I can't see any of that. But what I'm required to inspect is the roof covering. And so I'm inspecting the roof covering. This is the roof covering. That picture is in my marketing. I want to make sure that everybody knows that I walk upon the roof. I try to walk upon the roof for every client because I want to do this. I want to touch every roof covering. I want to make sure that everybody knows I'm up there. I want them to, I want my potential clients and their real estate agents to have reasons to hire me instead of the next inspector. And if the next inspector isn't getting up on the roof, then I want to make sure that I market that advantage, that competitive advantage that I have. It's a, they call it a unique selling proposition. It's something special that you can't get anywhere else. Well, maybe there are other inspectors who get up on the roof. And so I'm competing with them, but I don't want to compete with everybody. So I want to distinguish myself from all the rest. And if the majority or some of the inspectors don't go up on the roof, that's okay. You're not required to. But in marketing, it's all about giving your clients reasons to hire you. You want to overwhelm those potential clients with a wave of value so that they're really not looking anywhere else. They're just so overwhelmed. You want, you want them to perceive the value that you provide as being overwhelming in comparison to the cost. So when I charge $500, $400 for a home inspection, $500 for a home inspection and a termite bundled, or maybe it's a radon test or some other ancillary inspection, I want to make sure that that cost is much smaller than the overwhelming value that I'm providing. I want to just provide an incredible amount of value to my clients. I want to educate them on their home, how their home works, how to maintain it, how to save energy. Along the way, I'm going to tell the story of the home. Maybe it has some problems that can be fixed. And I'll tell them how to fix it maybe, or just recommend a contractor fix it. But I'm just going to assume that they're moving into this dream home. They found their dream home, and I'm just going to tell them the story. And I'm going to take them through the home, and everything's going to be great, even if there are major defects, because I am assuming they're moving in. I don't kill deals. I don't freak out people over things. I'm assuming that anything I find, good or bad, it's for my client who is moving into the home. And information that I can provide needs to be perceived as overwhelming to them. My service needs to be overwhelming because I want to increase my fees all the time. So in, in the general rule of thumb is if the perceived value is much greater than the cost, then it's a good decision. It's a good purchase decision. If the value that you perceive from this thing is way overwhelming 
in comparison to the cost. You always want to be thinking about providing value. You don't get paid by the hour. You get paid by the value you provide. Now, to calculate a profitable fee, you have to figure out how, you know, how long it takes you to do an inspection. But the value you provide is what you actually are getting paid for. Charge by value. This information that I provide here, these pictures, are of value to my clients in comparison to other services that don't provide that, right? So this is a competitive advantage that I have because I am providing my clients this kind of value. I am touching the main sewer vent pipe and the flashing around it. And I know how it's installed and I know its condition. And I can explain that to you in text, with words, and with a picture. I, you don't have to go up there. I'll do that. And I'm gonna take a picture of these components for you. And I'm gonna show you what it's like. Everything's okay on this. That helps assure my client that they've hired the right inspector. That's why I charge so much. This is a really good value. That's me pulling on the ridge vent. I know there's a ridge vent. How do I know? That's my hand pulling on the edge of it. I know that there's flashing in between your roof and the neighbor's roof. How do I know that? Because I'm that's my fingers there. I'm looking for the step flashing and the counter flashing. And it's it's right there. And I don't find any problems with this roof. No defects. And the gutters are clean. How do you know? Think. There's a picture. So you can do this picture too, if you do it, where's my drone? I like my DJI drone. Yep. Yeah, you can take that picture. You can compete with me. This is on the back side of the roof and there are no gutters on the back side of the roof. I'm not sure why, some kind of architectural, oh, I'm sorry, this is the front of the roof. This is the front of the roof, sorry. There are no gutters on the front of the roof. I don't know why, some kind of architectural design that I wouldn't like, right? I would never tell my builder, hey, uh, take those gutters off of my roof. I kind of like the way they look without gutters. Um, you know, it's starting to deteriorate in the corner here. It's been patched up already and this is rotten here and it has a poor patching. And the same thing's gonna happen here. You know, I know there's a drip edge and it's extended over, but, um, wind driven rain or something like that. This ain't gonna last very long. And this shingle is like, this is an extension of about three inches, right? So those shingles are just gonna flop over eventually. And you can tell on the underside, this is the eaves, this is the soffit vent, this is the fascia board. Um, this board is just gonna have stains on it. It's cosmetic, but you know, every roof should have a gutter unless you live in a desert. Um, some sealant, while I'm inspecting one system, I'm inspecting other components. While I'm inspecting the roof covering material, I'm inspecting this flashing area where two windows meet. When anything, like an intersection of two different materials or two different components, like two windows touching um, a, a, a flashing area or something like that, I like to get in there and take a look to see where, I try to imagine water trying to get into the house. This is the this is the back of that one, and this is the front of the house. And you can tell the old shingles have deteriorated. So they didn't replace the front part of the house. Um, let me show you the house again so we can see. So this is the, the top part of the roof that I was walking on. This is the front of the house. No gutters, right? We've got wood rot there. And then these shingles are starting to deteriorate. And if we go back to that deterioration, there it is there, there it is there. So this small section of roof, maybe a couple of squares could be replaced. So I'll put that in the report. And I'm coming down, I'm slowly coming down off my ladder. And there's my ladder there. I set that up, it's not right, but I didn't wanna damage the shingles by extending my ladder above the roof line. So it's really up to you on what is safe um, when you use a ladder. Internet G, Internet G College, um, has a, a free online um, ladder safety course. You can take a look. Next system is exterior and it's in the standards of practice, but I'm done. 
when I come down off of my ladder and I'm on the ground in the front front there, my clients probably are coming up at eight o'clock or whenever the home inspection begins. I've got my hand out, I've got business cards, big smile, uh, fresh breath, and I'm welcoming them to their new home. Thanks for hiring me. This is the first time we've met. And here's how it works. I'm going to inspect the roof and the exterior, and I will walk you through. If you'd like to join me, that'd be great. Um, or you can just go in and, and take a look around. If I find something wrong, um, I'll, I'll for sure explain it to you. Um, and then uh, there's a couple things I want you to see, like how the heating system works and where's your hot water tank and shut off valve and electrical panel and, and things like that. And um, so whatever you like to do, but the condition of the roof is good, except for the front and the gutters there, a little bit of road rod. And, you know, and now I'm going to take a look at the exterior. So whatever you want to do, a couple minutes of explanation right there, help set the expectation, help them feel more comfortable with me. This is the first time we've met. It's a strange business where you get hired before you even meet your client. And then um, the agent is there, inform the agent what's going on and tell everybody at the very end, because I'm using mobile software, I'm going to uh, provide a, a summary of the problems that I find, if any, right? And then later on, I'll, I'll provide the full report, which no one reads. Uh, exterior is next. Oh, I have a question for you. Let's see if I can launch a poll using this system, okay? There we go. Oh boy, here we go. Ready? Um, can you see that? I wonder if you guys can see that. Can you see the poll? I don't even know if it's projecting on your side. Um, I'm hoping it is. Oh yeah, it is? Okay, so here's the poll. Here's the question. Are home inspectors required to find and report upon every defect in the home? Yes or no? or I'm not sure. And we'll do this for like, I don't know, 30 seconds or so. So 30 seconds, is gonna hurry up, let's go. Greg, it's not showing up on your side, I don't know. Or maybe that's the answer. So there's a question and it's a poll and hopefully it's showing up on your side, I don't know. Uh, it's the first time I've used it in a while. So let's see, I don't see anything else. I don't see any buttons, but the poll is supposed to be on your screen. And the question is, are home inspectors required to find and report upon any defect in the house? Yes or no? And so we have answers. So let's end the poll and let's share the results. Can we share the results? Did, you, did I share the results? Here's the results. 9% um, of you said yes. 87% of you said no, not required to find and report upon every defect. And 4% of you are not sure uh, the no's have it. Um, we are not required to find and report upon any, every defect. Um, only the ones, only the defects that are both observed during the inspection and are deemed to be or considered to be material defects. And that's, that's a defined defect that is written out in the standards of practice. That's what we are required to do. Um, I've got another poll, but we'll do that one later. Okay, good, awesome. Most of you passed, that's fantastic. So not required to find every defect. Um, in fact, in my inspection report, I tell my clients in my agreement, in the contract that I have with my clients, um, I explain to them, that you are going to find problems. After I perform an inspection, you're going to find problems that were not discovered during the inspection. Why? Because that's not the purpose or scope of a home inspection. It's not to find every problem or to report upon every problem that may exist or may exist in the future. That's not the goal of the home inspection. That's not the value of the home inspection, right? So you gotta set that expectation, not required to find every defect. Now, when you know that as a home inspector, maybe if you're new, that, that could be like really great to know, right? <laughs> because it, it removes all this burden from you. You know, you're not required to find every defect. It's impossible. 
It's not possible. And you're not responsible for future problems, right? You're just responsible for putting in the report defects that you observe during the inspection that you deem to be material. That's like really serious. Now, the other defects, the other type of defects, there are a bunch of other defects, like maybe a stain in the carpet. You're not required to put that in the report, but you could if you wanted to. You can exceed the standards of practice. If your client really wants the dripping faucet to be a big problem written out in the report, it's really your call. You're not required. It's not a material defect. No one's going to get hurt over a drip. But you can put it in the report if you want. And I do, actually. And I can show you the inspection report coming up. I want to make sure that the water from the roof is getting away from the house. And uh, I think this is a basement from the front. Um, I wasn't too sure what type of house this was. Uh, let's see, where am I? I'm at 53. So when I pull up to this house, I like to take a look to see what's going on. So this is a townhouse, shared walls, two stories, maybe um, slab on grade, maybe no basement. Maybe there is a basement, maybe a crawl space. I don't know. This was kind of odd when I pulled up that, you know, I think about access, accessibility. This is a very strange staircase, no handrail, bunch of steps, and, it, you know, there's no room for someone to come in here and walk up the steps because if you can imagine a big car parked here and a big car parked here, you can't get in here to go up here. Like, where are the steps? Like, this should have been dedicated to steps coming down and people walking in from their parking area or put it to the side or something. So if my client has trouble, has a need for a handrail to get up into the house, I'm going to put that recommendation in there, right? You need a handrail here or an easy way to get up in your house from the parking area. I'm not a code inspector. Code inspectors are very different from home inspectors. I'm not a code inspector, thank goodness. I like to have fun during an inspection. Code inspectors do not have fun during an inspection. Home inspectors have a lot of fun making money and helping people out with valuable information that they need just before they purchase their dream home. That's what you do. I'm looking at the front step, making sure this is all sealed here, no trip hazards. Um, this settled a little bit and they patched up. That's just fine. Here's that step. Um, so there's a trip hazard here. This used to be straight across and now it's like a half inch or an inch different. Oh, let's, let's do something fancy here. Can I get, yeah, there we go. Look at that. So that's a defect there. It's gonna be a trip hazard. Um, maybe there's an HOA that can be contacted, right? This isn't the homeowner's problem. Maybe there's something that can be done. And these aren't level. This, this actually settled downwards this way in one big form. This one settled, so that pulled down. So there's a trip hazard here, and none of these are level. They're all sloped just like you see them, right? They're all sloped in the wrong direction. Um, they're not washing away water. They're, they're puddling water. And then th there's problems down here as well. So this step, you can see, that's how much it settled right? This is supposed to be level straight across and it's not. So this is a trip hazard. Probably hardly anybody uses it because it's so difficult to use. Um, and maybe the HOA. I'm not responsible for the HOA. Maybe there is an HOA. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I care, but I'm not responsible for communicating that. I'm just going to tell my client my observations and then my client can take that information and do whatever they want with it. Parking looks good, just the steps. And it, it's not accessible using that stairway. All exterior receptacles need to be GFCI protected. These spigots, hose bibs, they call them, silly, um, should be frost proof. This is, um, this is an inspection in a cold climate and that should be frost proof and it's not. So this could freeze up and burst um, during, during the winter time. There's the water meter uh, reader there. And when I was taking a look at that, I saw a crack in the foundation in the corner. Now this is a masonry. Um, it's not built out of masonry in the structural thing. This is just the front veneer and it's a crack there. So I'm gonna take a look at, the first thing I think of is like, what's going on down here, right? What's going on down there? I don't have to be a structural engineer and I don't have to diagnose. What I have to do is again, what? Report upon 
the problems that I find observed during the inspection that I deem to be material. Maybe this is a big, major structural problem. I don't think it is. But I, I would like to know what is causing cracks, not just through the masonry, sorry, the mortar, but through the masonry units themselves. So this is a, this is a good crack there. Here's another view of it. There's a crack there, crack there, crack there. So I know this is a corner, short corner, but I just don't know why it's cracking. And is there water? There weren't really water problems. So I don't know. I don't have to know. Um, oh, by the way, it's, this is not efflorescence, right? Um, because we have, let's see, other bricks that are white. It's just the other bricks are black. It's just a cosmetic um, wash that they have on the bricks, different colors. So it's not efflorescence, which could indicate moisture problems behind. So it's something going on. So I'll take a look down in the basement or crawl space in that corner, see if I can see anything. If I can't, I can't. I'll just report it as right now in my head, I'm thinking monitoring recommended because I can't stick a, a quarter in there on edge. It's not really separated, right? It's not displaced. It's not moving. It's not bigger on the top and narrow on the bottom. I don't see any big movement, but I want somebody to keep an eye on it. That's my job. Um, wood rot, because no gutter. This is the back of the house. Satellite dish, not responsible for this, but I, I am gonna look to see if the fastenings there on that base are sealed. They should be sealed, you know, sealed up. A nail through a shingle is a potential water entry point and satellite installers know this. And so they should seal it up really well. Sometimes they don't. I'm thinking of the gutter in the back and the downspout diverting water away from the house. And it isn't. This is a downspout that discharges hundreds of gallons of water during a heavy rainstorm right next to the foundation of the house and this is the back side of the air conditioner unit. The gutter straps, I didn't do this. I didn't need to. I saw the roof in the back, the lower secondary roof on the back from the front. You know, I, I put my ladder up in the front, crawled over, walked over the ridge and came over here. So I didn't put my gutter, somebody put their um, ladder up on. So this just popped there. That could be snapped back into place. And this is missing a strap potentially. Maybe it's laying inside the gutter. I don't fix problems. I used to build homes. I could fix this problem. It's easy fix. Click. But I'm not going to fix the problem. What I'm going to do is when I find a problem, I'm going to take a picture of it and put it in the report. This is a minor problem. Homeowner may be able to fix it. Probably a contractor, somebody in the neighborhood. Maybe the HOA does it. I don't know. There's the back. I have an electrical panel. There's the neighbors. There's some telephone and cable stuff that looks like a dryer vent. There's that downspout discharging behind the air conditioner unit. See, when I take a look at something, I like to see where, is there anything? Okay, where are my systems? Where am I gonna go next, right? And so this is a, a bunch of names, like Bilco door or a hatch door, a door to the basement. That's interesting. I'll take a look at the surface and then there's the air conditioning unit as a concrete porch. So I'm trying to identify the systems and then take a look at the components. And the grading looks okay. There's a sewer vent, and then the bottom of this is a concern, and it looks okay. And it's me with my screwdriver. So if I go around and just tap on things, right, I, I can hear if it's soft. If it's soft, maybe I'll see if I can probe into it. If, I, if my screwdriver goes into something um, that's supposed to be solid, that's a defect. This may be an indication of wood rot, right? Um, and so that's a picture and I put it in the report. All exterior receptacles should be GFCI protected. And these are, that's good. Um, there's a missing retractor thing-a-ding on the storm door in the back. No big deal, it's minor. I'll put it in the report. This too, missing a you know light, light bulb cover or whatever. No big deal. I'll put in the report. Looking at the grading, looking at the condition of the steel doors, 
There's some minor rust there. I'll put that in the report. This is a dryer vent. Not sure what's going on, but it needs to be cleaned up. I think uh, some, uh, you know, something went wrong, it cracked here. Um, not sure, maybe it was cleaned out, right? And they couldn't get it off to clean out the, the vent pipe or couldn't put it back on or so, something. Maybe the electrical line got in the way or something, but this needs to be attended to because we don't want a dryer to cause fires at a house. There's the electric meter, electric line going in, but it's an old electric line. And that's the outer sheath of the line. And I, I wouldn't mind it too much unless like, you know, like I can now see the threads, I'm sorry, the, the, um, the electrical uh, components, right? The line is in there. So my concern is water and electricity. This protective sheathing on the outside is to protect the electrical line from uh, being, being hit by water intrusion. And this just curves in and goes into electric meter. So there's an opening here and there's an opening here in the line itself in the service entrance cable. So I'm gonna keep that in mind. What I wanna do is go down into the basement, keeping things in mind that I already saw. And um, uh, I want to make sure that I put those two things together. So the crack in the corner, remember in the brick, and then the, um, the crack in the sheathing, I wanna make sure I match those two things up while I'm down in the basement before I say anything really. I'm just going to kind of, hey, you know, if my client was with me, I'd be like, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for water in the electrical panel. And for that crack, I'm going to see if there's a reason that the corner may be cracking, right? I don't know. But there's the grounding electrode and the rod, and it could be pounded down a little bit. There's the, um, could be a heat pump, could be air conditioner, could be both. It's a heat pump. And there's the manufacturing label and the condition, and it's running. And it's on a nice stable base and electrical disconnect. So the heating and cooling, it's basically the same thing. There's a heat pump, oh, down in the basement. So I'm gonna, let's see, are there questions? Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Audio is great, good morning. Uh, uh. Paul has a question. Do you, let's, let's slide this over. Can we slide this over? Do you know what the legal requirements are in Florida for advertising mold assessments? Yeah, I do. So go to nachi.org slash Florida, nachi.org, N-A-C-H-I dot O-R-G slash Florida. We have state specific and province specific and country specific pages of information. You can find them easily just by typing in nachi.org slash and then type in whatever. If it's two words like New York, it's one word, nachi.org slash New York, one word, nachi.org slash Alberta natchee.org slash Florida. And there'll be some information for that. Um, are websites uh, able to be created before becoming internationally certified and then the certification logos later someone will become certified? Yeah, so the, the uh, inspector website builder can build a website for you um, before you become internationally certified. They only work with internationally members and the website works really well. We become certified and so, um, um, they don't work for non-members. So you have to be a member of InterNACHI and then um, ideally you get certified and you can start that website design long before you become an InterNACHI certified inspector, but you have to be a member. Um, David, do you provide, do you post the slides for the download? Yeah, sure. Just email me, ben at internachi.org. It'll also be on the video page. Um, we record all the webinars and it'll be below the the. Uh, video recording. Before you inspect the roof, can I assume you talk to the homeowner first to tell them what you were doing? Yeah, actually, after I, I do the roof inspection, because my client um, is not permitted to follow me up on the roof. After I come down from the roof, I explain everything, the inspection process to everyone. Um, would be discussed over the phone or contract. Yeah. So my office manager would set everything up. Sometimes we actually don't get to talk to the homeowner. It's really the agents that we talk to and the agents that we know, know the, know the process. They know what's gonna happen. So we actually don't talk to the homeowner until face-to-face, -face, until we see them face-to-face -face. Um, in your home. But you, know, you can send out a text 
to your clients that explain the process. You can send out a text or an email to the homeowner or listing agent to prep for the home inspection. Little reminders about it's coming up in two days. It's it's in starts in one hour, things like that. Here's what to bring, things like that. Uh, in your home inspection business, how is the pay structure set up for your home inspectors? Uh, they were all uh, salaries because, well, they started off as 1099s working per hour because they probably had some other gig or something going on while they're trying to figure out how to get trained and become a home inspector full time. So we're training them and you pay hourly and then you switch it over to salary. You know, uh, IRS makes it very clear the difference between a subcontractor and an employee. And, um, and there's that little time in between where you're both testing each other out. So you can do 1099s. Um, and then, yeah, um, it's going from there. Uh, what pressure valve are you looking for when testing a pressure valve? I don't, in Pennsylvania, it's not required. I know some places like Texas, you gotta, you gotta use a pressure gauge. Do I have my pressure gauge here? Where's my pressure gauge? Uh, must be in my truck. So you can put a valve pressure gauge on um, the outdoor spigot and see the pressure. And then you can also um, test the flow if you're doing a flow test. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, Bill says, yeah, people, okay. Um, yeah, but if there are people in the house, you're just gonna be up on the roof without giving people a heads up? No, uh, obviously I knock on the door, drink, drink, drink. Um, I introduce myself. Um, they're probably, um, you know, scrambling to get out of the house because they know it starts in 15 minutes, but I'm there early now. They're all nervous. Oh, um, ha had they read the email that we sent them or the text, um, they would know that I'm going to be a little bit early, um, but, you know, people don't read. Um, and so uh, ideally they would be seeing me because I pull up in my big van that has home inspector stuff written all over it, big ladders. And, uh, you know, they're ready, to, they're ready to go. But I I knock on the door. I introduce myself. I've got my um, internet ID. Uh, here's, my, here's my vest. And I've got my ID on my vest, you know, to identify myself. And I can pull it out and show them my ID. And they should be expecting me. Um, maybe not early, but that's okay. And I don't need to go in. So when I come up, I'm carrying my stepladder. I'm assuming because of the design of the home, I'm gonna have an attic access. I'm carrying my stepladder, I'm wearing my vest, and I'm carrying my tool bag. And I set it all down on the front, ready to roll. Knock, 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 introduce myself, explain what I'm here early, sorry. Uh, I'm gonna go up on the roof. You don't need to, um, you know, you don't need to do anything else. Uh, my, my home inspector clients are gonna be here in about 15 minutes. I'll be outside on the roof and that's it. Right. Um, in Texas, pressure, yep, should be between 40 and 80 psi, um, where it's required to be tested. What's your review of that drone? Um, I love this drone, DJI. I think it's a mini. There's a mini two. Oh, this is a mini two. There's a mini something else. But this one I like. Um, it's what is it? Less than a half a pound. Fits in my hand, and um, 4K, 4K pictures, 4K video. Comes with an app. It's really great. Um, the adjacent building has a got. Yep, I need three minutes, three feet over the roof surface when using electric. That's correct. Um, unless I think I'm going to damage the gutter, which I think was true. I could see that this gutter. I hate the the gutter with the strap over the front because when you push on the gutter, which is what you're going to do when you use a ladder. They're gonna pop. And that's what happened in the back. Do you remember? Somebody put their ladder up on the back. It wasn't me, because I only I don't need it. And they pop the straps and it flies off and he loses it and all that stuff. So I do things as safe as possible. I used to build homes and installed roofs and for many years. Uh train people on ladders. Um, I know the the rules on on the ladder, but if I'm gonna damage property by following the rules, then I'm gonna adjust the way I use my equipment so that I don't on purpose um, damage something. Now it could be, I could damage something during the inspection just because I'm inspecting it and that's okay. I'm like, if I uh, turn on a dishwasher and it leaks all over the floor during an inspection, that's okay. I'm not buying a new dishwasher. 
I, I caused a problem, but I'm supposed to cause that kind of problem. I'm not supposed to like damage a gutter because you're supposed to be three feet above it. Yada. Right. Uh, this is a public staircase. It's not the owner's property. Okay. Let's just assume that that staircase in the front has, is not the property owners, but let's assume my client um, comes out of the house and falls down those stairs. Well, that's no good for anybody, right? So if I knew that those stairs are a trip hazard and I purposely didn't tell my client because I think some, some HOA could be responsible for this. That's dumb, right? I have to tell my client, like, hey, these stairs are not going to be safe. And you need to get the HOA to fix this or whatever, whoever. Maybe it is your responsibility. Maybe it's not. I don't care. They're not safe, right? And I know this because I know some standards, building stairs. And I want to tell my client, don't use these stairs. Look, there's not even a handrail, right? This is just chop that whole thing up. But I inspect without any regard to who owns what. Oh, you don't have to inspect the common places. Now, what are you talking about, right? If there's an electrical hazard and it's in a common area, I'm gonna tell my client, there's an electrical hazard right there. Don't touch that. You get electrocuted. In fact, you know, we should put a barrier up. No one touch this. I don't care if it's not your responsibility or not. Do you own that? I don't know. Who cares? That's the awesome thing about being a home inspector. You know? Uh, let's see. Not inspect, but comment if it would pose a hazard. Okay. Okay. Oh, this is the conversation. You guys should be chatting on the chat feature, not using questions. Would it cost? But would it cost the three hundred to do that? Okay. Um, okay. Cool. Q and A. That was good. Q and A. Questions on the Q and A. I'll take a look at the chat later. Look at this freaking shutoff switch for the heat pump. That's like a commercial building shutoff switch. I don't know what they were thinking. You just need a little switch, tick, tick, like a little light switch. Okay, whatever. So this is the electrical shutoff switch for the heat pump. Like you need to hang on it in order to turn it off and then turn it back on. Okay, um, that's a heat pump. There's the refrigerant line. Uh, large line is called the suction line. Liquid, liquid line is little diameter. This, uh, if it's on hot, it should be feeling, you can stick your thumb and feel the suction line. It should feel warm and hot. Uh, when the heat is on and the air conditioning, the opposite. Um, this produces condensate when the air conditioning is on and the condensate is draining away. I've got a little trap there, but here it goes. Goes into the perimeter drain. So the slab is a floating slab, it's called in the United States. We float the slab, the concrete slab on gravel. And there's a little space often in between the foundation, which is built first, the concrete block foundation to the to the right here, these are ICUs, uh, concrete block units. Um, and this is another row. And then the foundation, the footer below this row is right there, right? And there's a little step here and some gravel. Now in here, right, there's gallons of water being dumped in this perimeter drain during the summer months when the air conditioning is on and it's producing condensate, it'll drip. all day long. It gets wet, it stays wet, and it's a perfect condition. There's dirt in here because it's a basement. It's a perfect condition for mold growth. Now I'm not saying there's mold here, there's black mold, there's a health hazard. I'm just telling my clients, this ain't the ideal thing. Every home should be safe, sound, clean, free of vermin, you know, it should be managing water, should be energy efficient, all these good things. And this is not managing water in the best way. Because I know in my head, there's a thing called a condensate pump, and it's like a hundred bucks, right? So just for a little bit money, a little bit of money, that's a lot. You can put it on a credit card or maybe negotiate 
you know, when you get in, you know, with the seller to have it fixed before you move in or something, something. Manage water. This is not managing water. This is a builder doing something cheap just to make an extra hundred bucks without using a condensate pump. It doesn't even go into a sump pump pit. It goes into a place where it's not designed to drain hundreds of gallons of water a month, right? So um, I'm gonna tell my client this, and it's an easy fix. You need a condensate pump, right? Air filter, this is the cheapest filter that comes with, you don't, you don't even buy it. It comes with the manufacturing, right? They, the manufacturer sticks this in there. So you need an air filter that actually does something. And this one's clogged. So there's some delayed maintenance. When I see this, I smile because <laughs> I'm going to tell my client the heating and cooling system, HVAC system, has been serviced and cleaned probably for more than a year, could be longer. And the filter is clogged and it's the lowest efficiency filter that you can get. So it's not doing anything, right? So what we want to do is we want to get this HVAC system serviced and cleaned before closing, before you move in, ask the seller through your agent to get this serviced and cleaned by HVAC contractor company, a local one, put a label on it, stick a nice air filter in there, look at the fins, clean the fins, maybe take a look at the ductwork, make sure this is serviced, it should be serviced and cleaned by a technician every year. So. Whenever I find this opportunity, I kind of smile because I know, like, I'm thinking, what are the defects that I've found so far, right? Huh, there's a couple so far, right? I feel like I'm starting to provide overwhelming value according to the cost. You know, I, I don't think about this a lot, but sometimes, like, I start to add up, like, all of the recommendations and cost estimates to make them make the repairs. And if I'm like at $1,000, $2,000, right, doesn't mean my client is going to negotiate and get $2,000 from the seller. Remember, home inspections in the United States, well, home inspections everywhere, not required. And, a, and a, my client can't demand anything from a seller. It's really just about providing valuable information to my client. And if I can put a dollar value on it, in my head mentally, maybe on, on paper, that's even better. Because right now, what do we got? Can you remember? Got the shingles, got the gutter straps, got the downspout, got the wood rot. What else do we have, right? Got the door, remember the little storm door thing? Oh, now we've got the heat pump condensate, then we've got service and cleaning. Oh, well, we're up to hundreds of dollars now, right? What else? So we're going to keep going. Maybe there's more stuff. My, my whole goal isn't to find problems, it's to provide information that's valuable to my client. In fact, if I inspect a home and it doesn't have one problem, right? Maybe it's an existing home, 30 years old, historic home, 80 years old, or brand new home, right? No one's lived in it. And if it doesn't have any problems, do you think I should charge my client for that? Heck yeah, that's incredible, valuable information. If there are no, if I can't find any problems in a home, right? If the summary is empty, there are no problems in the home. It happens. That's incredible value to my client. That's really good information. To, that's good to know that my home inspector couldn't find anything wrong. Wow, that's really good information. Wow, I feel really good. Yeah. Remember, you're not, not pricing your services based upon the hours that it took, the time that it took. You're not pricing it based upon the defects that you find. You're, you're, you're pricing your services based upon the incredible value you provide to your clients. Because, I'm going to talk a little bit about marketing, ready? Because 
of the word commodity. Like, if you don't know the word commodity, look it up. Hey, Google, what's the definition of? You don't want to be a commodity. You don't want to live in the world of commodity. A commodity is something that can be exchanged or interchanged with something else um, because everything is the same. Like one watch is the same as the other watch, or one barrel of oil is the same as another barrel of oil, or a bushel of corn is a bushel of corn, right? A home inspection is kind of like a commodity, right? Uh, you gotta better be careful. We all perform a home inspection according to the same standards of practice. We all write a report. We all take pictures. We all inspect the same systems and, and components. We all flush the toilets, right? We all provide a summary, right? We're all doing the same thing over and over again. What's different is the value of the information that you provide to your clients. That's what's different. And the way that I can get that information is different in the way that you get that information. So I inspect the roof in a different way than you do. I am trained to comment upon moisture intrusion problems and air quality issues inside a home. Maybe you're not. So that's the difference in our services. Maybe I use infrared in order to see things that other inspectors simply can't. And maybe you don't. So you have to figure out how you have to answer the question, why am I different? Or how am I different? Because if you're not different, you're just a commodity. Any inspector can be replaced with any other inspector. There's no reason to hire you instead of the next one, because you're all the same, right? So you want to figure out, you want to answer the question, why should I hire you instead of the other inspector? Since we're all kind of doing the same thing, we're inspecting the same, same homes, same roof, same systems, using same standards of practice, code of ethics, you know, we're all doing the same thing. What's the difference? And so I became very successful because we at our inspection company marketed the differences that made us different from all the rest. You want to be thinking like that. What, what makes you different and special? And then you'll be successful. Yeah. Okay. Look up the word commodity. You don't want to be a commodity. You want to answer the question, why should I hire you instead of the next person? Hot water. Uh, you can call it a water heating equipment. You can call it a water heater. You can call it a hot water source. Uh, water heating appliance. It, it's anything, an appliance that heats up potable water and supplies it to the distribution system in the house so you can drink it. And I love the code, right? I love InterNACHI School, online courses, tuition-free online courses, the only home inspector at college in the industry. We, we base the courses, I'll tell you a secret, all the courses are based on code, right? So it's like a lot of home inspectors go, well, I'm not a code inspector. We don't, we don't pay attention to code. Um, you're actually being trained um, according to code. And I love the 2021 um, IRC, chapter 28, where it talks about water heating equipment. And there's a section in there on the TPR valve, extension pipe, not the valve, but the extension pipe. And there are 14 requirements to the extension pipe of the TPR valve, just 14, just the, the extension pipe. It's really cool. You're required to look at the water heating equipment. There's the water tank. Um, the base, I always look at the base, I always look at the system, you know, from afar, and then I move in and I look at the top and the bottom, and then this shouldn't have any rust or watermarks, it's not, and it's, they kind of put it on wood and to lift it off of the, the, the concrete floor. Okay, uh, I think a pan is best, right? Catch it, maybe drain it into the sump pump or that perimeter train or something, something like that. Um, and there's the manufacturing tag, water, cold water coming in through a shutoff valve, hot water coming out. Um, somebody was messing around with the electrical. Um, this was le left like that. I didn't do that. It was open. 
and there's a TPR valve, it should be extended to the floor in, a, in an obvious area. So if it's leaking, everyone sees it. Plumbing. I think of plumbing as water coming in and sewage going out. In, out. This is the in, public water coming in through a shutoff valve, water meter, check valve, pressure regulator, water meter, water meter, valve, and jumper cable. So this is kind of like a system of parts, components. So a system is the system, and it's made up of components. And I to touch and take a picture of every component. So there you go. Uh, and that's a sh uh, shutoff valve going outside. Um, sewage drain going out, right? So there's some pipes there, some pipes there. I can't see everything, you know, a lot of restrictions. I'm just looking for anything that's leaking. There's a clean out at the main before it goes through the foundation. That's nice. Can't see behind there. I don't know what's going on. Oh, and that's where the corner is. So I can't even see that corner where the crack in the masonry brick on the outside was. But you're required to inspect the basement, foundation, crawl space, or structure. And so this is the finished basement. And I've got my two favorite tools. Here they are here. Here they are. This is a, um, a sensor for wet, <laughs> a wet sensor. I don't know what it was called, even a moisture meter. But it's, um, it's a hydro shark. We still make these. Um, once you get one, keep it. Um, it's extendable, right? And what I do is I can extend it up and touch the ceilings or extend through the floor and see if it's wet. And if it's wet, uh, so it gives me a little little audio and visual. I do not measure moisture content, even though I have a moisture meter. I, I don't care what it is. I just want to know if my thing says it's wet. And then it is a gardening tool. Um, you can extend one of the tines. This is a three-tine hoe. And uh, you can extend it out. I like to reach things. I like to hit things. I like to pull things, protect myself from dogs and cats. Just kidding. And it's a really good way to reach stuff. I like to reach above the foundation, grab the insulation, take a look, put it right back. No one knows. According to the standards of practice, I'm not required to move insulation, but I do because I want to see. I want to see stuff. So those are my tools there. Um, they still make them. Um, this is shots of the basement, pictures of the basement that. These are inspection restrictions. I can't see everything. And it also indicates that something else is going on. Like drywall was installed and then it was torn down. And like there's renovation going on. And I think there's electrical going on. So the first thing I think of is like, what's this electrical uh, wall receptacle doing up here? Um, is there a permit? Is this done by a professional? Or is this the homeowner doing something down in the basement? Not really telling anybody. There's low clearance. This is headroom clearance. This is like six foot three. I'm six foot three. I hit this a couple of times with my head. That's probably a dent for my face. Um, it's not even like code. I don't know what's going on here. There's low clearance. Uh, this is the stairs from that still door thing going outside. This is where I look for moisture, where the two components meet. So it's brought in in two pieces. This is bolted to the house and so is this. But right here is like a potential for water entry. Um, and these could be deteriorated with um, moisture intrusion. We saw a little uh, rust on the outside, but no big deal. And then I like to look at where two different materials um, come in contact with each other. And then down here, it looks like there was some water coming through. There's some, this is different. This is like mud here, and this is not mud. And this is efflorescence on the edge. And I don't know what's going on, but I know that's wet and damp. So I'm going to put in a report. I have I observed um, indications of prior water intrusion at the staircase, metal staircase to the basement from the outside. Monitoring is recommended. And then we talked about this here, all the water being drained into the perimeter drain. There's a lot of um, unfinished construction um, picture's worth a thousand words. I don't know what's going on here. It's either renovation or demolition or, or something. I don't know what's going on. A lot of inspection restrictions here. We already did this before. Like, what if there's a defect 
right here in the floor. Well, it's not going to be in the report because I both I have to both observe it and deem it to be serious to put it in a report. I can't see anything. I mean, there right now, if I was doing an inspection with you live right now, and there's a, a whole uh, leaking toilet above my head, ugh, and I don't see it, it won't be in the report. Or if I don't think it's serious, it won't be in the report. If it's if it's um if it's hidden somewhere behind this furniture here, right? I, it won't be in the report. Why? Because it's it's it wasn't seen during the inspection. Now, when my client comes to their home, it's closing day, right? Where you sign on the line that's dotted. And you're going to buy the home. All of this is going to be cleared out. It's going to look completely different. It's not going to look like this, right? It's going to be nice and clean and open. You're going to see things that weren't seen at the time of the inspection. There could be something behind this bookcase. So in my report, I take a picture of this and I explain, like there could be things that we find during the, the walkthrough before closing. I assume they're going to hire me for closing. It happened very, very few times. I don't know why. It's a great time for an inspection. If you're gonna buy a home, you should hire the same home inspector twice for the home inspection, right? And then for pre-closing walkthrough, just before you sign on the line, the, to buy the home, you should walk through the home. No report is needed, just a walkthrough. Take 15, 30 minutes. Just walk through the home and see if you see anything that you couldn't see during the home inspection. It's a great time. What a great service. Every home inspector should be marketing not just one home inspection, but two. Two home inspections per client. There's only a few ways. There's like, I think there's nine. But there's only a handful of ways you can make more money in this business. And one of them is you sell more inspections per client. And man, you should be marketing two inspections per client. The full home inspection that takes about three hours and then the walkthrough. That's really good. And man, what a great comparison. What a, what a great service that is to have the seller remove everything from the home. Make it all clean, broom swept, and allow you to take a look one more time, right? Who knows what you find? Um, that, that, we saw that, we saw that, saw that, saw that, saw that. Oh, that's me with my tools. I got my flashlight. There's me with my moisture probe going through the carpeting, into the padding, into the concrete floor, in the corners and sides of the basement. I want to make sure that nothing beeps. If it beeps, we got a problem. So there's a rep representative number of wall receptacles should be inspected. So I do that. There's the basement. Can't see anything. This is a live wire and it just stuck up here. So if you're a home inspector, you need one of these. This will help you. Let's see if it, there we go. I have something wrong with my head. So you need a voltage leak tester, right? And you touch wires with a non-conductive material and to see if it's live. And that is an indication that there's some kind of electrical wiring going on that is not done by a professional, right? So it could be the homeowner. I'm not here to point fingers, not here to blame anybody, not here to reveal anything. I'm just here to observe, observe and report my observations. And we have unprofessional workmanship. We have renovation, we have unfinished things, we have potentially you know, safety issues and electrical hazards. Um, we need an electrician here or a contractor. Somebody needs to come and finish this up, tighten it up, uh, you know, because there's that's a few things now, right? So there's these things. I got some paint cans, you know. It's okay. Looking behind things, looking at the main load bearing beam where it rests on the foundation. A pan underneath the hot water tank would be a good idea. The renovation, you know, obviously, you know, some of it is finished, some of it's not, or maybe it's the demolition. I don't know what's going on. And why is it going on? Why was it built and then torn down? Like, what's going on there? Was there a leak upstairs, maybe? Maybe the dishwasher leaked. 
destroyed the, the drywall because this is, see this crack here? This is from someone grabbing a piece of drywall. Ever do demolition in construction? I did. You just grab it and pull it down, right? So someone is just going through this thing and just tearing it apart. This is just tearing apart drywall off of the basement ceiling for some strange reason. And, you know, I don't know why, but my report will tell my client to ask. And now, now you have information, right? Um, some unfinished work there. Garage, there's no garage at this house. Electrical is next. According to standards practice, I got to inspect the electrical panel. Um, main disconnect, if it's labeled, that's 150. So I know it's 150 because I use one finger for 100, two fingers for 200, and one and a half for 150 amps. Um, we want at least 100 amps. Uh, I don't see any problems with the outside. Um, they're, they're labeled pretty well. Um, oh, but I have one GFCI here. Usually I have GFCIs more than that, but this is an older existing dwelling, no AFCIs. Hmm. So according to modern code, right? If this house was being built today, there would be AFCIs. What are AFCIs? AFCIs help, help prevent fires from starting. So they say, GFCIs are really important. They've been around for a while. So if I was expecting the home to have AFCIs, I would see them here and a couple of GFCIs maybe. So what I do in my report is I recommend AFCIs. It's not in the summary, but my homeowner should understand that AFCIs are a safety device. They weren't required when this home was built. They weren't even, they didn't even exist when this home was built. So obviously they're not there. And I shouldn't expect them to be there. But it's a good idea to install them because it's a safety device and it's missing. Similarly, when this house was built, you didn't need smoke detectors in every bedroom. I forget what year that was. I don't care. I'm not a code inspector. But today, every bedroom should have a smoke detector. And there should be a smoke detector in the hallway outside the bedroom. And there should be a smoke detector on every floor of the house including the basement. That's a modern standard. Maybe this home was built to code back then when they didn't need all those smoke detectors, but now they do. So I'm gonna put it in the report as a recommendation to install, install smoke detectors, similarly AFCIs. So I have a question for you, ready? Here's a question. I'm going to launch the question. Hopefully, you all can see this. If you can't, I'll read the question to you. Folks who can see the question can answer, right? And the question is, should a home inspection report include recommendations to fix things that were acceptable when the home was built, but are now a defect according to the current building code? And I gave two examples, GFCIs and AFCIs and smoke detectors, right? And another one is the space between the spindles or balusters of a railing or a guard. They're called guard now. We used to call them guard railings. Now they're called guards, they're just guards. But there's an opening to allow more than a big, uh, a four inch sphere to pass through the guard. That's a hazard according to modern code, but it, it wasn't always like that for, Older homes, you can have a foot in between the spindles and be okay. So my, my question for you is, should your report include recommendations to fix stuff like the space between the spindles or the missing GFCIs or missing smoke detectors or missing AFCIs? Because the home was built when all those things weren't required. It was built to code back then, but it may be like, if you compare it with modern code, it's kind of missing all those stuff. Should you put that in a report? What do you think? All right, I'm gonna end the poll, right? I'm gonna share the results. Hopefully you guys can see this. 84% of you said yes, that you as a home inspector should have those defects, those things that were acceptable when the home was built, but are now a defect according to the building code, modern building code. 
84% of you said yes. And I agree with you. I agree. I, that's how I inspect. In fact, I inspect without any regard to the age of the home. What? I don't care when the home's built. That doesn't, doesn't work in many situations. Like if you're doing an insurance inspection, like wind mitt, wind mitigation inspections down in Florida, you have to know when the home is built and what uh, code and all that stuff. We're not talking about that. We're talking about really like, uh, what's an example? All the kitchen counter receptacles should be GFCI protected according to modern building code. If I'm inspecting a home and there's GFCI protection for receptacles, but they're only within six feet of the kitchen sink, the ones that are beyond six feet, they're not protected. And I test it and it's truly not protected. There are, there's receptacles at the kitchen counter that are not GFCI protected. I'm putting it in a report. I don't care when the home is built. I don't care when the code changed. I don't care any, about any of that stuff. It really is a safety device and it really should be put in the report as our correction is recommended. That's why home inspections are so fun. Code inspectors are nuts. They have to know what year that switched over and when the home was built and what was there a permit and was it renovated? And is this, is this part of the renovation? Is this old and original? Ugh. Right? We're not code inspectors. Code inspector books are this thick. You have to memorize it. And it changes every three years. That's an important point, actually. Code changes every three years. Do you know why code changes? Do you know why the home that you're inspecting now was built back then, like according to a code, but now is like they have a problem? It's because we just learn more. We know what's better. Code changes oftentimes, unfortunately, tragically, because someone got fatally injured or seriously hurt. And so they changed the building code in order to make the dwellings safer and now more energy efficient. And they perform better. It's called building science. We try to change the way we build homes so that they can be more comfortable and livable. And so if you, if you were just inspecting in the past, right, everything's going to be great. No problems. You're going to Forget, if you're inspecting, if you say things like, well, that's how it was built back then, you are discounting all the people that got hurt in order to make the code changes and make our home safer, right? I'd rather be on this side, thinking about the latest modern standard, building standard, and try to help people bring their old homes up to standard so that they're safer and more comfortable and energy efficient and perform better, okay? So that's what I do. You're not a code inspector and the home inspection standards practice, um, don't mention this issue very much, right? So it's really your choice. I recommend, I just love recommend, um, inspecting without any regard to the home age. There's one GFCI, they're labeled, Got some other labels. Oh, uh, look, there's the original wiring. There's the original wire, maybe a second newer wiring. And I think we saw this. <laughs> Remember this wire? We saw this all curled up in a floor joist bay. You're not required to remove the dead front cover. I do. Why? Uh, just take a look, a closer look. And in here, I see indications of water and even rust. Water on top of the main breakers, right? Inside the panel. Why? Well, maybe it's because of that sheathing. Remember the sheathing? I forgot about the sheathing. The electrical line, the service entrance cable, the outer protective sheathing from the meter into the panel itself is opened up for water intrusion and I find water marks inside the electrical panel. We need an electrician. What great valuable information I'm providing to my clients. They're gonna buy the home. I'm not killing the deal. I'm providing them valuable information. And there's the other breaker. Everything looks good. Laundry. There's a laundry there, uh, the window opens and closes, got the dryer, got the laundry tub, there's the valve, um, the drain, it's a 
it's a trap, a tra an S trap, and ideally it'd be a P trap. S trap, it's kind of gurgle. Um, and then the odd place for the clothes washer hoses, they should be um, pressure tested hoses. These old black hoses um, often burst. And maybe that's actually what happened down in the basement. Um, so more information there. Um, you can see a little drip right there. So I'm running hot and cold water. Hot water tends to expand things. And sometimes when fittings expand, they leak. And this one leaked right there for me, right on the towel. So that was really nice. And um, receptacles and laundry need to be GFCI protected according to modern code. This receptacle is not GFCI protected because the house was built to code way back when. And now it's not safe right there. It's missing a safety device and it's an inexpensive fix. So everyone is safe. Attic. Remember the time, time management? Guess what time it is? 10 o'clock. And I'm smiling because I'm going to get paid in about an hour after doing a really great inspection for my clients. They're getting really valuable information, a ton of valuable information. There's the standards of practice helping me figure out what to inspect. And I'm not going to walk on this nice surface of blown in cellulose information. I'll do it some other way. I'm not going to walk right in the middle. Maybe I'll walk on the right there. I'll walk on the trusses. The trusses here are not covered up. Ideally, like they'd be covered up with insulation, but since they're not, I can put my foot right here and right there and walk around if I wanted to. I'm not required to. If there isn't a floor, you're not required. That's an inspection restriction, but I like to walk around a little bit and try to find things, maybe missing components, maybe missing fastening, maybe roof like indications of something. I'm looking around and whoop, there's the second floor bathroom vent, blowing exhaust, warm, um, humid, moist air from the bathroom into the attic. And ideally it would go directly outside, not in the attic, even though there's outside air in the attic, it needs to go outside, not into the attic space. So uh, there's a home inspector business card. I have no idea why they did that. That's an ashy inspector there. And they, they like to put business cards next to things that they find. Um, and so this could introduce a lot of moisture into the attic. And um, what happens is like in the winter time, remember this cold climate, that moisture condenses on a cold fastener and it drips on the insulation. And I see that on the insulation, actually. I see drips on the insulation, marks. All these little, you can't see it in the, in the slide, but these are indentations. That's not mouse indentations. I know what that looks like, but these are like little drips. I'm like, huh. And it's not insulated very well. There's only five inches of insulation. Guess what? This home was built to code back then when only five inches of insulation was required. Who is going to say, well, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Not me. I'm going to tell my client that according to modern building standards, they double this thickness now because we know better about energy efficiency and things like that. Here are the watermarks on the top side of the attic access panel that is not insulated. So you can see the watermarks from the drips, from the fasteners that is caused by poor ventilation and also introdu introduction of an enormous amount of moist, warm air into the attic space during the cold winter months. The, these drips, no big deal, right? Except it um, reduces the thickness of the cellulose insulation because cellulose insulation, when it gets wet, starts to, so maybe it was a little thicker. It's not five inches, maybe it was six or seven inches, but it got wet over the many years. And now it's like down to five inches only. It's really neat to apply what you learn in building science. Where are you gonna learn a course on building science? InterNACHI, the only home inspector college in the home inspection industry at internachi.edu, we have building science courses that help you understand uh, what you're seeing and maybe put the story together. I love the story. I love the story. And also in the summertime and the wintertime in this house, 
you're heating up the house, right? Second floor is all warmed up, but this attic access panel is not sealed or insulated. So you have conditioned air, warm, moist air coming up into the attic space. So there's that bathroom fan and there's the um, unsealed attic access. There's a ton of airflow going through an unsealed, uninsulated attic hatch in the second floor ceiling. And it's a problem, especially in a cold climate. You're just losing conditioned air. So what you need is more insulation, but what you really need is sealing, sealing, not, not the ceiling above my head, S-E-A-L-I-N-G. You need to seal the airflow. You need to block airflow, stop airflow, or restrict it at least. Insulation doesn't stop airflow. That's not what insulation does. You know, fiberglass, we, this isn't fiberglass, but we, we call fiberglass filter glass because it just filters the air. It doesn't stop airflow. Energy efficiency in a home really needs two things. So if you're, in a, if you're a home inspector, right, and you go up into the static space and you say, hey, we need to install more insulation. Okay, I'm done. You really should have mentioned ceiling and insulation and get a proper contractor up there is going to do both. We have a lack of insulation when we all have any ceiling, you know, you need to air seal and insulate. And that's in our energy efficiency course. We have an energy efficiency course for home inspectors. Okay. Bathrooms. Okay. People are asking questions. You guys are awesome. Let's do, um, let's get to the kitchen. Okay. Okay. Let's see if we can go a little bit faster because we're running out of time. What time did we start? An hour and a half ago? Yeah, we better pace it up a little bit. Okay, ready? So I flush the toilet, run the shower. I, I find a, a mark in the tub, right? I push on the corners of the tub here, tile. And, you know, I'm looking for water leaks, water leaks, a GFCI protection. And then I, I pull the plumbing access panel. You know, I take a look and I put it back. But I, I open it up. It, you know, plumbing, plumbing access panel is where, like, the tub guts are, you know, the shower fixtures are and the, the drain. And I open it up. And if it's not there, I actually recommend it to be installed because it's really handy, especially when there's a water leak. So I open it up and then I put it back and I go, there's a water leak right there. Water leak. I don't see the home inspector card here. Yeah. So there's a water leak here and that's a defect, right? I don't know. Did I cause it? I don't know. Who caused it? Or, or it's been doing that for a long time. There's a water mark there. Maybe it's, it was the second leak, maybe the third leak. I don't know. I don't know why it's leaking either. I don't know. I observed indications of an active water leak, plumbing leak at the second floor bathroom tub drain through the plumbing access panel. Correction recommended. That's what I say. First floor bathroom. There's uh, drain pipes and all that stuff and GFCI, we've seen this before in an event. That's good. Interior. Representative number of windows and doors, representative number of wall receptacles and switches and light fixtures. Take a look at the ceiling, the floor, and all that stuff. It's usually just a bunch of cosmetic stuff. But here's what I like to do I like to remove the floor grate, right? The grill, register, whatever you want to call it. Stick my hand in there carefully and pull out all this junk that has collected into the ducts over the many years. A lot of it is from when the house was built because the sweep up, a lot of contractors <laughs> like to sweep up the floor by sweeping it right into the floor registers, <laughs> right? Um, or, you know, the carpet was pulled and that carpeting hair, uh, remnants is just swept into the registers. You know, they don't, they don't take it out. They don't throw it away as garbage. So a lot of things go into the registers. Now, this is way beyond the home inspection standards of practice, but I love it. Indoor air quality issues. I'm a healthy, I'm a certified healthy homes inspector. How do I get certified as a healthy homes inspector? InterNACHI has certification programs through our online inspector college. So you can become one of these 
crazy nut inspectors who sticks their hand in duck work looking for stuff that my client may be sensitive to, right? It all depends on, on how, what kind of value you provide, you know? I like to hire a home inspector who does things like this. I don't want to hire a home inspector who purposely refuses to for some reason because they only perform an inspection according to the most minimum standard. They don't exceed it. Uh, you know, you get what you pay for. So here's a windows here. Representative number, tilt, uh, wall receptacles, looking in the corners, um, missing doors. Um, I think they fell off because all that stuff, look at all that. So there's a missing doors at the closet. And then uh, some paint on the ceiling. I don't know why. And then there's that and windows and doors. It looks good. And drapes and front door and first floor and more receptacles and the wall. And then I found a, a broken piece of furniture. Somebody sat on that chair and broke it and it wasn't me. So I want to put it in the report. That I observed broken furniture. Here it is. It wasn't me, right? I don't know. Could be someone else at the time of the inspection, before the inspection. It could be the homeowner, the occupant, the renter. The, I, I don't know, but I'm not going to get blamed for this. In fact, the way to not get blamed for it is to tell everybody about it. Be really transparent. This is what I found. It's broken wasn't me. In fact, if you do break something, not furniture, if I did this, I'm buying a chair, but I didn't do that. But if I broke something like, um, if I test a GFCI tester, if I test a GFCI receptacle with my tester and it doesn't reset, I didn't break it. I found something broken. I'm not replacing, I'm not repairing that GFCI. I'm putting it in the report as a repair recommended. If I, I said this before about dishwasher, if I turn on the dishwasher and it leaks all over the floor because the gasket is or whatever or something, I'm not paying for that. I'm gonna wipe it all up and put it in the report as a repair recommended. I'm there to, to break stuff, to find things that are broken and to have things break in my hand because I'm doing a visual inspection, but I'm using normal operating controls and test buttons. Like everybody should test their smoke detector. If, it, if I test the smoke detector and it falls off the ceiling, hits me in the head, you know, knocks some sense into me, and it's all broken or something, right? Um, I'm not buying a new smoke detector. I'm taking a picture of it and recommending that a new smoke detector be installed because I'm just testing it with my finger or the test button and it broke. If I open up a garage door opener, you know, with the wall button and it falls off the rail, I'm putting that in the report as a problem. If I, um, if I fill up the Whirlpool tub in master bathroom, right, that nobody uses, and then I drain it and water starts to come out in the ceiling below it, right? Well, I'm going to stop the water from doing more damage, but I'm not repairing that. I may have broken something, but... It's not my responsibility. It's my responsibility to put in the report defects that I both observe and deem to be material. That's what I'm responsible for. If I am poking that porch post in the back, remember the picture earlier and I was poking the porch post and my screwdriver goes through the porch post because it's rotten. I cause damage, I cause damage in the post, but it's because it's rotten. I, my screwdriver didn't do it. My screwdriver just discovered it. In fact, I like to leave my screwdriver in something that's rotten and take a picture of it and put it in the report, right? So you're there to, to, to uh, do damage. That's your job. And that we wrote an article about home inspectors doing damage doing in, during an inspection. And it's in our library of articles at that URL, natchiorg slash articles. So take a look at that and look up the word damage and it's there. It's a good article. I'm in the kitchen. Let's finish this up. Run hot and cold water. There's a garbage disposal. There's valves, there's a drain pipe. Whoop, missing clamp at the electrical line at the bottom of the garbage disposal. Uh, GFCI and missing GFCI right there, right? Oh, it's, I think it's that one. That one is missing a GFCI protection. 
dishwasher, ran it, stove, anti-tip, oven, microwave. It doesn't exhaust outside and exhaust inside. Uh, microwave works. Here's my infrared pictures. Um, there's a water problem here. My infrared camera picks up a, a water mark there. That's from the second floor bathroom. No big deal. I like the colorful infrared images. You can do black and white too. And it's, it's kind of like the same. It's not the, not the same really. I like the shock and awe of the colors. And infrared is, you know, it's affordable now. I and mean, you can get an infrared camera for 500 bucks. Every home inspector should have infrared. This is an E5. I don't know if they make them anymore. But, you know, a FLIR C2 or there's other infrared manufacturers. I've got them in my tool bag, you know, as backup. But infrared just helps home inspectors do a better job. It'll Infrared allows home inspectors to see things that other inspectors who don't use infrared can't. I see things that other inspectors can't. And that's one reason why you should hire me instead of the next inspector who's doing the same inspection. Here's my inspection report. Um, got really good questions. Green energy. Thanks, Austin. Jenkins, AJ. Um, I'm looking at the questions. I'm not sure what I should do because I'm running out of time. I promised you two hours. I don't want to go over. I want to respect your time. Maybe um, let's look at the report, okay? Let's go through the report and then I'll, I'll do questions. How about that? Because I don't want to leave this. Okay, here's my inspection report. This is my actual report. I removed confidential information. So it's table of contents. So what really matters in a home inspection, I'm trying to set the expectation of my clients. There's really like four things that really matter um, during an inspection. Um, there's major defects. An example would be a significant structural defect. Things that may lead to a, a major defect, like a small water leak coming from a piece of flashing or something, and things that may hinder your ability to finance or legally occupy or insurance the home, or insure the home. And that could be like a, a structural damage caused by termites. And then a safety hazard, such as lack of GOCI protection. So there's four things. We could talk about a lot of stuff during a home inspection. I can shove a lot of information in the inspection report, but um, it's really... What really matters are those four things. And I put that article, which is available for all home inspectors to use, in my inspection report, page three. It's really important. Um, some introductory stuff and then pictures, right? Um, I'm using my mobile software. I'm taking pictures. I'm writing the report as I inspect. So I'm efficient with my time. I'm not flying through the home, not running through the home. I'm inspecting, writing the report, taking pictures, taking video, and producing the report as I inspect. So at the end of the inspection, I have a summary with a click of a button. I have a summary of things to pay attention to, go fix, negotiate over, whatever you wanna do. It's a summary of problems that I observed. And then I'll produce the report later. And the report looks like this. Not all the pictures are in the report, but some of the pictures that I like are in the report. Some of them I want in the report so that other people reading my report, like the seller and the listing agent can see that Oh, he walks on the roof and he touches things that he inspects. That's kind of neat. Yeah. And I like to write the report um, with blue things on black ink and red. Red means take action. It's either monitoring or correction or improvement or something like that. Like, that correction is like you need a contractor. Improving this or adjusting that is like the homeowner can do it. And monitoring that is just like for anybody. Just, just keep an eye on it, right? But it's all red. So there are the components there. We went over this. We saw all of these things during the inspection. Condensate problem, water coming in, water coming out. There's a hot water tank, extension to the floor. There's electrical line, sheathing. I see water inside the electrical panel, lack of AFCI breakers. There's some demolition going on. I don't see any permits. So a lot of restrictions. There's no water. This is my inspection report. I do this in three hours. There's the problem with the condensate and the humidity in the attic, lack of insulation. There's some water leaks. There's the bathroom water leak. There's the kitchen, the clamp on the GFCI. Everything else works. And there's my infrared pictures. And smoke detectors, right? That's it. Oh, right here. Like I write the basement 
rear room is presently going under renovations or remodeling, work being done, work not finished. Therefore, you should request documentation that should include permits or any warranties or guarantees that might be applicable because we don't approve or uh, endorse any work done without permits or latent defects could have, uh, exist. We don't evaluate unfinished work. You know, we're not there to say, oh, so far, so good. You know, keep it up. Um, illustrations, you can get them from Internet Cheese Gallery to make your, your reports uh, beautiful or more beautiful. I like those. I just threw those in there. And there's a conclusion and walkthrough. I'm trying to remind my client that I'm available for a walkthrough. You know, just before you uh, sign on the line, you know, I can go through the home and we could see things that we couldn't see during the inspection. And then I leave behind a, a letter for the homeowner. And that is it. Let's see. Do I have questions? You guys want to keep going? Should we keep going? I can go all day, right? Let's see. How much do you charge for the walkthrough inspection? A hundred bucks. How much do you charge for a walkthrough? A hundred bucks. What is a ballpark you would charge for a pre hundred bucks? <laughs> List multiple inspection per client opportunities. It would be great to have a guy who is just now forming the plan. Okay. I don't know what the question was. Would you charge the same for the walkthrough inspection? You no. Uh, if you're like a third quarter less, if you're inspecting a mobile home, uh, the it, it's really about time. So it should be about 15 minutes or, or you know, half an hour. And, you know, a hundred bucks is probably pretty good. If you're inspecting a mobile home with the water heater behind the wall that you have to unscrew, do you inspect? Yeah, I just unscrew it. No big deal. Taking the screws off. That's, that's what a homeowner would do if they wanted to take a look at their water heater. I don't do anything that like um, a homeowner doesn't do, right? That's, that's my world. Like anything I touch, anything I open, anything I click, anything I turn on and turn off, that's what a homeowner would do. If a homeowner would do that, if a homeowner would test the GFCI button, test the smoke detector, turn on the dishwasher, that's what I would do. That's what I would, if they would tap on a, on a tile to see if there's moisture damage behind the tile wall, that's what I would do. If they would lean on, um, uh, if they would lean on uh, a bar inside a shower that they need to lean onto in order to support themselves getting in and out of a tub, that's what I do. I, I, if, the, if a homeowner would lean on a guard on a second floor deck, that's what I would do, right? I don't do anything more than that. I just stay in that world. And if, it fall, if that guard falls off, if that shower support falls into my hands, if that smoke detector falls and hits me in the head, if that GFCI detector doesn't reset, if that dishwasher leaks on the floor, if that garage door opener falls off the rail, if that window that I tilted open or open and closed, if it falls out of the frame, all these things actually happen to me. Um, I don't repair, I don't take responsibility for that. I didn't break it. I just stayed in the world of being a homeowner, living in the home, and seeing if something broke. When, when I break something in a home, first thing I do is I turn around. So I'm waiting for somebody to pat me on the back for doing a good job. And then I take a picture of it and put it in the report. Whenever I break something in, during a home inspection, according to the standards of practice, using normal operating controls, and something breaks, that's a good thing. You're doing your job. Good job. Did you trip all GFCIs or representative number and all that? I try to test every um, GFCI breaker and GFCI device, and I test the ones that are supposed to be um, protected. And that's a lot of breakers. But I test each, for example, all the exterior receptacles. I'm testing. It's great to have a team. When I had another person, another inspector, that inspector is inside resetting, and we test, reset, test, reset, test, reset. Um, yep, Matthew's right. So what if the bathroom has no plumbing access panel? Um, I'm marking, a, very good, Matthew, you're awesome. Maybe you should be an instructor. Uh, do you make sure your water flows at laundry hookup? No, no, I don't turn, I don't turn the clothes washer on. I, I don't turn the clothes washer on. Um, my clients are there though, and sometimes they'll do that, right? I don't do the, the that. Do you include all the pictures that you take in the kitchen report? No, I try to include as many pictures as I can because um, it, it looks nice. Pictures look nice. Pictures are worth a thousand words, literally. So I like to say 
as many words as possible through pictures in my inspection report. Is that leaked from the panel? Yes. Ben, where'd you purchase your vest with the ID slot? From? I don't know. Uh, okay, here it is. Niche, N-I-C-H-E. And it's called the Tool Series, N-I-C-H-E, Tool Vest. Uh, I think you do a short webinar on report writing. Yeah, Chanel. Boy, what a great first name. Uh, I think I would, I would like that. If you'd like that, let's do an inspection report writing. Why don't you, why don't you, um, ooh, why don't you post somewhere like on Instagram or Facebook or our forum that you are demanding that I do a report writing uh, webinar? Where can I live in that inspection report? Where can I, oh, where can I view that inspection report? Um, you can email me. I, I can send it to you. I'll, I'll put it um, on natchiorg slash webinars under the video recording. Where can we get that, get the typed pages you display? Yeah, okay. So if you want my report, oh, here, here's one. Go here. You still see my screen? Hopefully you can still see my screen. Home, what is that? Oh, geez. Home inspection checklist, hold on. I'm trying to find report. Mm, hold on. Inspection mm, 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 mm. checklist. No, how about sample? Here it is. Here. Okay, long URL. I'm infamous in making long URLs. Ready? It's natchi.org. Maybe I can bring this up. This is a really good resource. So I'm going to bring this up, okay? It's natchi.org, N A C H I dot org slash home hyphen inspection hyphen report. Oh, geez. hyphen samples. Oh, there. That's the URL. Um, there you'll find a bunch. Oh, sorry. I'll leave it up. There you'll find a bunch of sample reports written by certified master inspectors, including one of my reports or two of my reports. There's some Texas specific inspection reports there as well. Okay. Natchee.org slash home hyphen inspection hyphen report hyphen samples. Oof, sorry. Questions. Uh, is it possible to find a peer in Edmonton? Can you find a peer? Um, yes. So here's where you find um, peers. Natchee.org slash mentoring. Natchee. Oh, let me bring this up. Oh, oh, for you folks listening to my podcast, I'm, I'm bringing up URLs on a little screen. Um, Natchee.org slash mentoring. Okay natchi.org slash mentoring. There you'll find peers or mentors. Um, if you wanted to find like um, people in your zip code who are inspectors that you may want to hang out with, uh, I'm doing that today. I'm hanging out with two inspectors, Britt and Chad, natchi.org slash chapters. There's that and natchi.org. Oh, and then uh, to find other inspectors, inspectorsseek.com. So I try to um, have lunch and um, a coffee with inspectors around me. So I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm, uh, I think it's at two o'clock. I'm having, I don't know, I think we're having coffee or something. And we're going to talk about business and marketing and um, chapters and events and see what we can do that's fun to get folks together. So those are three really good um, URLs to find other people around you because you're not alone. Natchee.org slash mentoring, natchee.org slash chapters, and inspectorseek.com. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Can we get a copy of the report? Yep. Do you recommend a combination of smoke and CO detectors? Yes, because that's modern building, right? Do you test the TPR valve on the water heater? Heck no. No way. What if it doesn't reset? You're messed up. Ben, I'm not the kind of answer, but I would like the more insight. I've been in a lot of water heaters that the contractor is running packs straight out from the top instead of a copper engine, but packs is described. Yeah, they have to be. Um, that's man so manufacturing recommendations for certain um, components and systems within a house. You have to be familiar with them, or you can have uh, digital copies of the most common, like the PAX distribution panels. 
where uh, I don't know if you know, like the blue and the, and the red pipes coming out and they're plastic and they got these little valves, you know, out of a manifold. Like there's certain things like, you know, you can't be at an angle, for example, coming out of the manifold, you have to be straight and it has to have a support. Like if you, if you have a picture of that or some digital representation of that, you can refer to that. You can also write the report later, you right, and make an addendum after you do some research. So manufacturer's recommendations, you're as a home inspector, you're not responsible for knowing and referring to and recommending manufacturer's recommendations or installation instructions. But I would have those available in my inspection software. And also you may want like a binder, right? So you go into your tool bag and like pull out a little binder, you know, something that can be like a little flashcard, you know, be like, uh, let's see, what does that say? Yeah. Uh, okay. Got it. And then continue. So that you're not responsible for manufacturing uh, recommendations or manufacturing installation instructions. If you know plumbing and electrical knowledge, should you take classes for them in order to become an inspector? If you have no, now, no plumbing and electrical knowledge, should, um, Carla, uh, go to natchez.org and take some classes. Right? You can even take the exam, the online inspector exam, without being a member, without paying for it, because it's free and online to the public. So take the online inspector exam and test your knowledge. It'll tell you where you're strong and where you're weak. And if you're weak in a certain area, like electrical or plumbing, it will give you a recommendation like, oh, why don't you take our plumbing course, right? And then to access the plumbing, you have to be a member of InterNACHI. It's only $49. Try it for an entire month for $49. Take any, or uh, go back to the beginning of this recording and get a free membership. I think I gave you a free membership using a code. And um, yeah, you should always be learning. Um, never stop. That's why Internetchi, it's it's really important to hire a home inspector and be a home inspector's uh, uh, be a home inspector of Internetchi because we require all of our certified inspectors to take continuing education. Your real estate agent that you're going to meet tomorrow is required to take eight, maybe twelve, maybe six hours of education every year or every other year. That's like nothing. You are a professional certified or licensed professional, and you're required to take CE as well. And if you're internet our level is really high. You gotta take 24 hours. Now, if you're in, it sounds like a lot, 24 hours, but if you're into it, like you do like an hour here, an hour there, you go to a convention, you go to a chapter meeting, it adds up like that, right? It's very easy. Mm. Is, is my sound dropping? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. My sound dropping? Am I running out of power? Here, let me plug in. Hopefully it's okay. Hopefully you still have my sound. Or maybe it's a, a sign that we should stop. Right? He's still here? Hmm? I don't know. Okay. Maybe we should stop. That was a lot of fun. That was two hours. I hit my goal. So let's go back up. Natchez.org slash webinars is where we are doing free live online webinars. Natchez.org slash webinars. Hopefully you can still hear me, but go here. Natchez.org slash webinars. I'm Ben Gramico from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. This was a free, live, interactive, online, hopefully valuable webinar. Stay safe and healthy, everybody. And I'll see you on the next webinar. Bye.